Hello, I'm Andrew Suskind, and I'm a psychotherapist and author based on the west side of Los Angeles since 1992, specializing in trauma and addictive compulsive behaviors. Welcome to my podcast, named after my recent book, It's Not About the Sex. Here we have honest conversations related to compulsive sexual behavior and trauma, all from a sexual health perspective. Our intention is to offer fresh viewpoints and practical strategies toward establishing greater intimacy and a more deeply connected life. Let's begin. Hello, Sue. Hi, Andrew. How's it going? Um, doing really well. How are you doing? I am practicing joy. It's a fun thing to practice. You know, I've been immersed in, in this uh, recent uh, documentary. Um, I know you have been too and, as well. We were like, like parallel immersions. But for those who ha haven't heard about this, I think most people little by little are hearing about it. But this is a, a documentary uh, called Mission Joy, Finding Happiness in Troubled Times. And it's based on a week-long experience or conversations between the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu back in 2015. Yeah, I was definitely, I didn't want it to end. And what about it did you not want to end? Just, well, I know that Desmond Tutu did pass away recently, actually. Yeah. Um, so I think it was just that, like, them sharing their friendship and and... I mean, for two older men, I just, they were adorable, you know, and they just, from their pores, you could just see their joy and, um, mm -hmm. and contemplation, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it was just, it was a wonderful feeling almost to be in their presence, you know, and, and being hypnotized almost into it and feeling like you were there with them. It was done really well. That's a great way of putting it. I, I, I love the content of it, which we're going to be discussing today, but watching the two of them together was, was such a treat because to me, it looked like a bromance of sorts where they apparently had spent like half a dozen very brief visits in the past. And then this was a five day visit. So it was almost like they had this vacation together. Right. And I, I forget who said this. One of the interviewers said, you know, spiritual leaders don't have much time to hang out with their friends. <laughs> so this was extraordinary for them to be together for five days. And like I said, it was in the spring of 2015. So this is pre pandemic days and watching them. I agree that not only were they adorable, but they were just energetically. It, it felt like they were so present, so grounded, so incredibly loving, and so peaceful. Mm -hmm. And and I agree, I didn't want it to end either, because I just enjoyed the energy that they were exuding. One of the things that the Dalai Lama said is, how can we have joy in the face of suffering? And I thought that was a big question. I'm not sure whether it came from Dalai Lama or whether it was the interviewer. And then he said, suffering is an ingredient for developing compassion. And I thought that was so beautiful because we, we think of suffering sometimes as, as simply suffering, like, like end of story. But all of us have some form of suffering or another. It's universal. And to develop compassion out of our own suffering is, is such a, a powerful notion that the suffering isn't for naught. It's actually a pathway towards having compassion for others. And if I can ex extend that to have self-compassion as well. Yeah, I, I, that was a common theme. And I noticed that also with his question when he was answering about joy. How, how do you find joy? And it was, again, an external thing. Like you find joy, it's a reward for giving joy to someone else. It's that connection piece, which is so mm -hmm. big in addiction. 
For sure. And I'm so glad you brought in the word addiction because I was looking at everything they were saying in the documentary through the lens of addiction and trauma recovery. And so everything they shared can be applied universally, but it can absolutely be shared with addiction and trauma healing. And um, I just want to go back to what you said, because Desmond Tutu said that joy is actually the reward, that giving joy to others is basically what life is about. And and then he, he said this, which I thought was very touching. We wipe the tears from the eyes of another. And, and that that's really a mandate. It's not like a an option. It's really something that we do in order to bring to others some kind of comfort. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm wondering, Sue, if we can go back, because I could talk all night about these uh, various um themes. Mm-hmm. But can you talk a little bit about the two men, Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama? Sure. So, well, we De- Desmond Tutu came from poverty, um, spoke a lot about the relationship of his mother and father and how he's estranged from his father um, and how he, the father hit his mom. And yeah, it was quite a horrendous story. It looked like mostly physically abusive. And that as a child, when when Desmond Tutu would hear that going on from the other room, he just felt incredibly helpless, like any child would. And one thing that is so outstanding about his life is that he went through that intense childhood trauma. And somehow, and I don't know exactly how that healing came forth, but he transcended it by his determination for really being a a leader around not only spiritual leader, but a leader of freedom. And he kept saying something to the effect of, if you want freedom, if you are a believer of freedom, there's nobody that can get in your way. And it was so powerful. I mean, down to the bones, I was feeling that this this is a person who took on the establishment and decided he was going to be a voice for many people who are voiceless. I had no idea about his trauma and what he grew up around, you know, and f- mm-hmm. to rise out of that, wanting to give more is amazing. He's an amazing mm-hmm. soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the Dalai Lama, I mean, grew up in a palace, right? Was surrounded by abundance. But also did suffer some trauma when he was pretty much kicked out of Tibet and had to seek refuge in India. For sure. He was 24. And China basically said, get out of here or or else. You know, it was like very, very threatening. And what about the story of him disguising himself as a soldier so nobody would recognize him. I thought that was fascinating. Right. Yeah, I can't imagine, like, crossing 15 rivers and, you know, the stats that they were saying was just really difficult to go through. It's, it's almost unbelievable when, when you think about what they had to do in order to escape Tibet and, and go to India. And as a Tibetan Buddhist, his identity was such that, that he he actually brought i think his his beliefs and his um his voice to a larger um audience so to speak mm-hmm. uh, because he was able to get to india and have that freedom and um more of a vast um i guess ability to be heard right yeah the thing i wanted to go back to again is <clears throat> the dalai lama apparently i thought this was so fascinating he was given a test at the age of two to see if he had the qualities to be the Dalai Lama, because it's all based on reincarnation and on um, basically looking at the lineage and the, the, the details of whether or not he fit the bill. And apparently he, he, he 
passed the test with flying colors. <laughs> and like you said, he was brought to this palace, but he was actually taken away from his family. Right. Yeah. And it sounds like he had very little contact with his family, that he was in the palace with, you know, many, many monks looking after him and cultivating his his knowledge and wisdom, et cetera. But there's something so tragic that there there is a childhood trauma around being plucked out of your family at age two. And they didn't say a whole lot about that. But we're talking about two men, two spiritual leaders, two incredibly wise and, and knowledgeable, both academically and spiritually, who had childhood trauma and and somehow move through it yeah which i i find really almost unfathomable yeah i mean they did touch a part upon the part of like him being so lonely and and that that's heartbreaking to hear of a child being just the only child in this huge palace and I, I didn't get a whole lot of detail about the loneliness. You're right. They mentioned it. Yeah. But if I were interviewing him, I would really want to know more about his relationship to loneliness mm -hmm. and how that's followed him through his life. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that. Yeah. So the next time he allows a, an interview with me, I'll be sure to ask him that question. Yeah, let me know when that happens. I'll help you out with your audio. Perfect. They did have dogs in the palace. That's why I got Lola, because they had Tibetan terriers. <laughs> so those are the dogs of the Dalai Lama. So I figured I'd get that going for me. But okay. those are the dogs that were in the palace. So at least yeah. we know. And you you spoke of having a dog as a childhood friend, like how important that is. So I wonder in your interview with him, if you would bring that up. Well, I want to know how the dogs regulated his nervous system. So we'll put that near the top of the questions for sure. Yeah. I mean, like you said, having childhood trauma and and yeah. turning out to be what they are and what they present and giving so much back and having had that experience. I wonder how they did work through it because they didn't really talk sure. about it. So one of the things I wanted to come back to is just how they presented with one another, because the visual is that they sat in chairs very, very close to each other, and they touched a lot. They they held hands. There were moments in, in the documentary where they embraced and, and kissed on the cheek. Um, it was so affectionate, and, and there was so much joking and teasing and laughing and smiling and loving and touching. It, it really was like a bromance. Yeah. I mean, don't you think? Yeah, certainly. And the hand touching yeah. just, it felt like the Dalai Lama was looking for that human connection, that human touch. And that they just, you could see they just loved each other, like brothers. Yeah. Like, yeah, just could, they just got each, their energy must have just been just totally connected and, yeah, and it, I felt that through the movie also, but yeah. they it was comfortable. It wasn't like awkward, you know? They just were so super comfortable in each other's presence. Like, it was like they were hungry for it, almost. That's the perfect word. I think they were hungry for it, and I think there is nourishment for each other in a way that they're not used to, actually. Right. They can't and break that barrier with anyone else, but it was okay. Exactly. It was okay. That's right, and... I wish I knew Desmond Tutu's daughter's name, but she was great because every time she spoke, she was like narrating what, what goes on between them. And one of the things she said about the two of them is that it's like watching mischievous spiritual brothers. That's yeah, perfect. Yeah. Mischievous spiritual brothers. And and I think that was perfectly said because that that's kind of how it appeared. And they were just having fun. They were like two boys and they were playing and they were enjoying each other. And at the same time, they were the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Yeah. So so we got to see the, the adult in the here and now and the playful kid as well, which was just so, so fun to see. Let's just shift a little bit to some of the themes because I think it's so important to talk about the texture of what they shared. Mm -hmm. So the themes of their conversation really revolved around joy and compassion, kindness, and gratitude. 
And there might be more to it than that, but those were the main themes that I, I picked out of it. And the, the Dalai Lama said that his really purpose, what gives him meaning, is, is how can I help to spread compassion and love? That's his life direction. How can I help to spread compassion and love? And isn't that something, Sue, that, that we all aspire to? But so. sometimes in the busyness of our lives, we, we sometimes get distracted or somehow it gets buried or, or, or backburnered. Yeah, for sure. And I think ultimately I always say love prevails and, and it comes down to the love that we have for each other as being humans. And that was a quote I picked up from this was um, at the foundational level we're all, every human is exactly the same mm. and we're vulnerable to pain, to fear, to unhappiness. And we aspire to be happy, to, to seek connection, to find meaning, to find love. And it, it doesn't matter where you come from and who you are. It's, mm -hmm. it's the human connectedness. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so wonderful to think about, you know, that yeah, we're all, all under all the like you said the stuff that day to day stuff. You know, my car broke mm -hmm. down. Blah, 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 right. blah, blah. But <laughs> it's really the love. I don't know. Um, do you have a minute? I want to share a story. A little oh, story. Please. Our neighbors just rescued a family from Afghanistan, and it mm. it it took them eighteen months. They are so happy to be here. You know, they just knew that they needed to get out of Afghanistan and, and all their, everything got stolen. They have nothing right now. Mm. But our neighbors went to the Mexican border and was able to get them and, and bring them here. Wow. He's like, I feel so much love from all of you. And I'm so thankful that I am here and that, and you are all here. And they don't want anything else other than that. And, and how it illustrates what we're talking about today. You know, one of the phrases that I wrote down is that suffering is what makes you appreciate joy. Right? So these folks from Afghanistan have suffered in ways we can't even imagine. And, and now it, it, it helps them appreciate joy, actually in ways that might be more in technicolor than, than we could possibly describe because it's, 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 it's so extreme. So extreme. It's extreme. Yeah. yeah. But to see them so happy and radiant yeah. and shining and they, it's like they have no cares in the world right now because they're feeling yeah. that joy. Yeah. They are totally yeah. bliss. Yeah. So one of the questions that kind of goes along with this is how can people cultivate joy how can you and I, Sue, cultivate joy as a way of being, not just a feeling, right? As a way of being, which I translate into almost a lifestyle. Like, how can we integrate joy into our daily experiences? And I think it was Desmond Tutu. I can't remember. Sometimes I, I, I got confused who said what. Mm -hmm. But basically, they both said joy is about satisfaction and meaningful life mm -hmm. joy is about satisfaction and a meaningful life and i thought that was so simple but so profound right because yeah. how many times are we dissatisfied with things how many times are we complaining about this that and the other thing and and how many times are we not sure what really gives our life meaning and it's not easy. I think meaning or purpose is is a life a life journey that would that unfolds over time and it's different now than it might be in the future. But there's something about satisfaction and, and meaning that I thought was really powerful. And and then they went on to say that the key to joy, or one of the keys to joy, is to live from your own natural compassion. Mm -hmm. So what I what I heard was that we have to tap into our own natural right. compassion in order for us to live in joy. Interesting. Right. Getting through those layers and getting down to your natural compassion. That's yeah. 
something to think about for sure. Yeah, and that's interesting because the layers are oftentimes like pollution, like emotional pollution that all the stuff that, that gets, you know, like um, stuck on the top, but underneath we all have natural compassion. And again and again and again, they were saying that compassion for others is, is really where it really brings us to a, a place of joy. And what I heard in recovery terms or 12 step terms is how can we be of service more frequently? Right. And how can we be of service with compassion? So again, joyfulness is, is really about helping others. When you surround yourself with healers, like I, all day, I'm, I'm, you know, in this where I work, people helping other people all day. That's what they're all doing. And it's an amazing energy in that space. Of course. And I think what Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu really embody is being able to be compassionate for others in an egoless way, right? They're not doing it for themselves. They're not doing it to get anything at all. They're just freely giving of themselves. And I thought that was really palpable. No, and they're humbled by that, even yeah, when each other brings that up. Yeah. So what about the thing about pursuing happiness? Can you say something about that, Sue? Well, I mean, a lot of times we're we're inundated with like, buy this, get this, you need this, this will, you know, and and what people get tied up in is the pursuit of that, right? Looking for material things. Um, and what that does is give you maybe a little dopamine kick or something, you know, like, oh, I need to get that or, you know, the a lot of times people who are out shopping for example or they they get the thrill out of actually pursuing it and not actually like a fix yeah not actually getting it when they get it they don't right. really care well the thing that struck me is that it's in our constitution the pursuit of happiness right it is <laughs> and they were very clear that there is no such thing <laughs> And that that's all about material it's things. Material. And, and what they want us to focus on is a, about what happens inside. And I thought that was just such a fantastic reminder because how many of us are pursuing this, that, and the other thing in order to get happy out there, but really pursuing inner peace or pursuing compassion or pursuing joy, completely different story. Yeah. You know? So I wanted to highlight a question that the interviewer um, said. He's, he was saying that the Dalai Lama has been in exile for 56 years since he was the age of 24. And he said, why are you not morose? And, and I thought the answer was fascinating because it didn't feel exactly direct, but it really got something across. The Dalai Lama said, wherever you received much love, you call home. I, I get goosebumps because he, he, he was kicked out of his country at the age of 24 after being in this abundance for all those years. And then he basically says, well, wherever you received much love, you call home. And so I just wanted to, to highlight that because I thought it was so indicative of, of his philosophy really yeah, yeah but it feels good to hear that right oh my gosh yeah yeah so let me talk about research and i'm going to talk about one piece and i'm going to turn it over to you to talk about another piece so um they interviewed i always get her name wrong but it's sonia lubomirsky who is a happiness researcher at the uh, uc riverside and she has been studying happiness for years. She she has written books. And and what I found really, really interesting, and because I had never heard this before, is that the results of part of her research shows that acts of kindness for others leave two to four weeks of happiness within the person. Wow. So she was basically saying that, um, you know, if we do something for ourselves, that's great but it doesn't last. But if we do something for others, an act of kindness for somebody else, two to four weeks of happiness on the scale that she used 
remains intact, which I, I thought was fantastic. And she went on to say that it changes the RNA gene expression. So this is in the genes. It improves our immune profile. It improves our friendships. It improves our productivity. And it even improves our longevity. Wow. So this is major research. We're not just talking about lightweight research. This is like if we participate in acts of kindness on a regular basis, it can change our, our genetics. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I love that. Wow. So it changes the person receiving. Is that what? No. No, the person giving? Mm -hmm. The person giving, giving the act of kindness it changes. is actually the one that's having the, the changes, changes within. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the other person hopefully will benefit from right. receiving the act of kindness, but it's actually for the person who's offering compassion. Wow. So I wonder if that is becomes in the RNA something that your body is, craves. You know, you like, I want, I want to give more happiness. Does it beget more happiness? Probably, right? I suppose the doctor would be the best uh, person to answer that. But what I will say is we're talking about neuroplasticity. Mm. We're talking about a practice, right? Acts of kindness, we could look at that as a bumper sticker, right? Random acts of kindness. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about a practice that is changing the neural pathways, Wow. And so if our well-worn path is maybe to do an act of kindness once in a while um, or not at all, um, we're talking about daily or maybe more than once a day acts of kindness so that the new neural pathways can really take shape and the new, I call them grooves, the grooves can can actually deepen. Wow. Okay. In the brain. That sounds like a yeah. challenge. I'm going to take that on. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the acts of kindness challenge. What's the tube experiment? Is that what the... The tube was when they put the monks into that tube that looked like an MRI tube. Basically, what they did was they were comparing um, Tibetan monks with an average person, right? A person who doesn't meditate. That, I think that was the biggest difference. And um, because Tibetan monks are lifelong meditators, they were looking at their brains. And what they found, and this is a longer story, but what they found through this experiment that I call the tube experiment, is that well-being is a skill to be learned and nurtured. Mm. That well-being is actually a learned behavior. And that we know this, but, but we are biologically wired to be compassionate and, and, and to care for others, right? So what happened with the, with the folks who are just the average people who don't meditate is they just had kind of more of an uphill battle and it wasn't as natural. And, and the monks really had a, an experience where the, the brain would light up in such a way that they seem to um, really have have an advantage on those of us um, mm. who don't meditate. Yeah, and so it really, it really reminds me that I I want to increase my meditation because again, we're not talking about fluffy research. We're talking about really heavy duty, uh, meaningful research. So, Sue, can you share with us a little bit about what Desmond Tutu calls Ubuntu? So, yeah, what he was referring to was how, as people, we learn from others. And we learn from others in order to give back to others. So it's a circle of life. Yes. Yeah, we learn from others in order to give back to others. And I think if I were to do the interview with um, Dalai Lama... I think what he would say to us is that, yeah, we, we do learn things from others that are not helpful, but our job is to focus on compassion and love. So finding it, find the compassion and love from others. That's right. I, and it's awareness, you know, it, it's being aware of when that happens. Because I bet a lot of times there's compassion and love and, and we're just so 
caught up in other things we don't even see. Right. Our mind is distracted. We've got all those things that are, are taking us elsewhere rather than being in the moment. For sure. Yeah. So maybe slow it down a little bit. I kind of felt like they gave each other the time. You know, they were present with each other. They were just listening and absorbing what each other were doing. That was a great example of how to be a friend, how to be someone compassionate. Yeah. It really was like watching a peace summit and, and, and not only a peace summit in a, in a technical way and in a serious way, but a peace summit of, of illustrating what it's like to just hang out with someone and, and to share one's love and, and wisdom and, and they're both academically very, very bright. So it was full of uh, layers of, of learning. And as you mentioned, unfortunately, uh, Desmond Tutu died on December 26, 2021. He was 90 years old. And the Dalai Lama is alive and is now 87. And hopefully he'll accept my interview um, request. We'll see. <laughs> Well, you know, he does go live on Facebook and you can ask him questions. Really? I, I've been watching him live all during COVID oh. yeah, on his Facebook page. Fascinating. So, and you can type in questions. Excellent. I love that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's cool. So, Sue, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed talking about this film. I, I, I really recommend it so highly to, to everybody who's listening if you haven't seen it already. And again, it's called Mission Joy, and the, the subtitle is Finding Happiness in Troubled Times. And it's actually inspired by a, a book, The Book of Joy. I haven't seen the book itself, but definitely catch the documentary if you can. Thanks for listening today. It was wonderful, as always, sharing the time with my colleague and friend, Sue Merlino, and discussing this really significant film, if you're so inclined, please give us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe and share my podcast with those who may benefit. I look forward to you joining us the next time and don't forget to stay connected.